St. Stephen in the Fields is an historic Anglican church in Toronto's Kensington Market area. With its three culturally diverse congregations and programs for the homeless, this 150-year-old church is an integral part of the community, a church that some of its members say makes them feel accepted and at home. But it also sits on a prime piece of urban real estate at a time when the Anglican Church of Canada faces a financial crisis, and therefore the church has been threatened with closure. Money and the Maker, The Battle for St. Stephen's, is a film that documents the story of a desperate struggle by a community to save their church. With me in studio to discuss this issue and his film is Robin Benger, documentary filmmaker and producer of Money and the Maker. Thanks for coming in today. My pleasure. Now, what's interesting about this story of St. Stephen in the Fields, and certainly your film, is the way that you sort of start off almost as an objective filmmaker, but then really get drawn into the story and become an active part of the story. Why don't we start by talking about how you got into producing this film about this story and, and how you felt yourself literally having to become involved in, in the actual battle. <clears throat> well, there's a short and a long answer to that question. The short one is I'd been offered another big uh, directing gig uh, in a reality television show, and I'd covered, uh, I'd spent two years in Iraq and Afghanistan and Africa covering wars and what have you. And I just, I, I don't know, I kind of fell into doing something close to home because I've always been doing these big picture helicopter documentaries on global issues. Uh, the other part of it is um, that I was stoned in Somalia. Somebody threw a great big rock at me and, and would have killed me if it had hit me. And I came in contact with Islamic fundamentalist youth group. And in Afghanistan, I did a story on women. And I was really ripped up by how uh, mm -hmm. Islam, and in one particular case amongst poor people, how the Quran justified that treatment of women. And then I was in Bamiyan and I saw the Buddhas blown away. So there was this thing sort of fumbling about in the invasion of Iraq, too, about the role of religion in the world today. And it seemed to me that because I had been sort of raised an Anglican, because I had used religion as a young man to get my way, as I see it now in retrospect, and because I was a church guy, I considered myself Anglican light, I thought the time was right to do my God doc. Mm -hmm. But in, a, in the short answer is I went down to rent a car at budget on C College Street. They didn't have one. I saw a sign saying Mass at 10. I hadn't been in that church. I walked in. It was in, in the interior of the church is very beautiful, but the congregation was sitting on uh, steel, ch steel back chairs. There were about 30 of them. And uh, the warden stood up and says, we have to raise $400,000 by June or we're out of business. And I, I thought this crew could hardly get 40 bucks together. And, and so I you had literally a, just walked into the situation? Yeah, and I had one of those moments of epiphany. I canceled all my projects. I said, I'm going to follow these people for a year. Mm -hmm. Now let's, let's give a little background of, you know, why all of a sudden did this one particular downtown congregation need to raise $400,000? The big picture is that uh, 500 churches have closed down across Canada since the early 90s. Mm -hmm. In the case of St. Stephen, it had sort of bumbled along. It was a very, very strong church for many, many years, full to the rafters. Very interesting uh, congregation, a lot of uh, Car Caribbean immigrants. Uh, and, you know, about t 10 years before I walked in there, it had started to lose money. It hadn't been able to pay its way. Mm -hmm. uh, and the priest, the previous priest, had been there for eight years uh, and was getting paid $40,000 a year. Uh, his salary was being paid by the diocese, the mm -hmm. authority in the church, by head office. They call it Fort Adelaide. Um, and the new bishop came in and said, okay, 10% of the churches in the, in, the, in the Diocese of Toronto are going to have to close down. The money-losing churches are going to have to close down. And they, they turned to the congregation and said, and now you have to pay back the money that we were paying this priest, which suddenly slapped a $300,000 debt on these people. And this is right out of the blue. This is right out of the blue, uh, which is a complete death sentence mm -hmm. to that church. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you're dealing with something with history with these people. I mean, a church to them... Uh, and that particular church is just so rich and thick with, with their immigrant uh, histories that they, they weren't prepared to let go. And then another factor came in later, which was the community, 
which was a, a really interesting development in the story, I thought. Well, and, and this part of, you know, for people who don't live in Toronto, the Kensington Market area is a very multicultural, at the same time, relatively working class neighborhood in the heart of a very affluent and prosperous city. So that there were three congregations. There was a French congregation, but it was a French black congregation. It was a French a African congregation led by a very interesting Congolese priest. Mm -hmm. And there was an, a, a Spanish congregation, which was also a fascinating microcosm of Spanish politics and Spanish sort of class structure and backgrounds, you know, Central Americans and, and Latin Americans. And then there was the English congregation. So there were three congregations. Now, what's interesting here is sort of organically or from the grassroots, it was a gathering place for these different tongues and, and cultures. But because of the way, in my view, that it was managed, and this was part of my evolution from observer to adversarial, radical, whatever you want to call it, was the way that the diocese managed those three groups, which it was, a, I think, a case study in mm -hmm. truly dreadful political management mm -hmm. of immigrant cultures living together. Now, I mean, I think we should, let's say, look at that larger organizational diocese level. You know, as you were saying, the Anglican Church wanted to close down a number of churches within the Toronto area. And yet, myself, I'm not an Anglican, but, you know, I, when I look at the Anglican Church, it doesn't strike me that they're hard up for funds, or that they're hard up for property. Were they in a financially difficult situation, or were they taking advantage of a hot real estate market? Well... There, a report came out while I was doing this documentary which said there'd be one Anglican left in Canada in the year 2061, I think it was. <laughs> uh, their numbers have been dropping precipitously. Mm -hmm. But it is uh, an asset-rich church. They've also had the problem of the Aboriginal school settlement, right. which has cost them a whack of money. Mm -hmm. But that apparently has been paid off, $5 million, I believe it was. Um, that what's happened with the Anglican Church, and I think what is happening with established religions generally, is the heart is dropping out of them. And when people stop coming, the money stops coming in. And in any institution, unless it's a truly spiritual organization, and in the case of the Anglicans, based on the poor, it, it, it does whatever it can to survive. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's also a very interesting study of a calcified traditional institution that has, in my view, lost its way biblically or lost its way apostolically. And they just um, got themselves in a real mess with real estate. I mean, there's another story about the cathedral and selling air rights and getting free condos. Mm -hmm. It's really quite an extraordinarily uh, inflexible situation they found themselves in. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like a, a person who's inherited money and has no idea how to prosper in the new economy. So right. they're kind of panicking. So it's something of a crisis. And losing, you know, in this particular church, the average age. I went to the cathedral, actually, for the swearing in of the new bishop. And the, sh the vision that I have from the back is gray hair. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an mm -hmm. aging, dying congregation. Right. Young people are not coming into it. And I, I thought that was a very, very sad thing at the time, but I've changed my mind now. I'm curious to ask more about that, but unfortunately we have to take a commercial break. When we return, let's talk more about the actual battle to save St. Stephen. I'm speaking with filmmaker Robin Benger. We'll be back with more on this topic after the break. You're watching 3D Dialogue. Welcome back to 3D Dialogue. I'm Jesse Hirsch. And I'm in studio today with filmmaker Robin Bencher, and we're talking about his film, Money and the Maker. Now, before the break, we sort of got into some of the background of sort of the challenges that the Anglican Church is facing, and really the context and community around St. Stephen's. Let's talk about the battle. What did the community do, and sort of to what extent were they successful or not successful in literally trying to save the church? Well. I think it's uh, useful to know that within the church there was a split. 
So there became a, a battle between the sort of diocesan poodles, so mm -hmm. to speak. Sort and of the loyal people, to the yeah, church structure. Which, uh, you know, the, essentially the agenda was to shut the church down, vacate the premises by, mm -hmm. by the end of the summer. And those who resisted that, who were actually in a majority, and there's a point in the uh, film where everyone votes democracy, right? And everyone votes to defy the closure. Um, beyond the church, though, there, was, there were people like Martha who felt very strongly that the world should stop. Forget about Iraq. This was the story. <laughs> there should be a big media strategy. And uh, the uh, community, um, just an architect and uh, a local activist, and eventually about 38 people who live in that community and aren't at all religious uh, in the Anglican sense, or kind of come to that church became very sort of seized by saving the church. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a fantastic collection of people, and it was a wonderful movement. And, and this is what I think lasts, comes out of the experience for me, that there's actually, in a way, more religion in irreligious or a-religious people mm -hmm. than there is in ostensibly religious people. Mm -hmm. And it was only because of that campaign and the public relations that, that flowed from it and a fabulous concert they, that they organized. It's interesting, I haven't been involved in organizing, organizing too many charitable con uh, concerts, but everyone I knew immediately said, we'll do it for mm -hmm. free. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Daniel Lanois, Michael Ondaatje. We had to actually turn some really quite big names down. Who and was this just out of a motivation of their community spirit and ethic yeah, to save well, the church? Yeah, with eight days to go before the church closed, we're going to have this concert. And the uh, Diocesan Council was meeting between the concert and the closure. And it put so much pressure on them, I believe. The community involvement saved the church. Mm -hmm. The Anglicans inside that church didn't save the church, mm -hmm. which was a real revelation to me and which was the ultimate disillusion for me too because those people are still in charge of that church mm -hmm. um, so in a way they didn't want to save themselves so I was kind of wasting my time with well and, and in your movie I mean one of the things that struck me as so powerful about the film is really the charis the charis the charisma of the characters the fact that so many of the people you mentioned Martha as one example that you can't help but feel gravitated towards, attracted. And yet, at the other hand, you know, you obviously, in the interest of fairness, tried to give equal time to the diocese as well, who seemed to be not, that, not at all interested in speaking with you. Did that continue throughout the battle? The fact of the matter is, in documentary filmmaking, is if you spend enough time in any institution and people forget about the camera, wonderful characters will emerge. I mean, there's, there are great, there are, there are Al Pacinos and I guess uh, Sigourney Weavers out there on the street who will never ever be in a, a drama. You mm -hmm. just have to spend enough time observing their lives and you see great courage. And with religion, of course, really, it's a borderless situation. Everybody's forgiven, mm -hmm. right? Everyone can be as bad as they want, but really they're forgiven. And with religion, everyone's an expert and everyone's innocent. So you've got tremendous range of the characters. Um, in terms of the diocese, I, I, I quite honestly have never beaten up on people quite as badly, except for maybe a few pieces I did for the Fifth Estate. <laughs> I, I don't think I was balanced and fair. I made a decision to kick them in the nuts. And uh, that's what I did, and I think they deserved it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, I, I didn't exactly put horns on them, but I think uh, there's no question, as I said to the bishops, once they had not uh, treated me fairly, once they had, there was, there was an incident, doesn't occur in the film, but an article that was written about the Diocesan Council's decision to close down the film. And when the guy who's in charge of the director of communication, Stuart Mann, wrote that article, I gave him my comrade Robert Mugabe Journalist of the Year Award. <laughs> uh, I've covered a lot of one-party states and dictatorships, but where you shut down a village and you say the nation grows, it's, it was that kind of journalism. It was mm -hmm. absolutely atrocious. So from that point on, and having very politely and, and um, you know, in, in the formal fashion, wrote, written letters, phoned, done all the things you need to do, I suddenly said to them, who the hell do these people think they are? They're Anglicans, for God's sake. And they don't give me the courtesy of a reply or a balanced response. They just hoped I would go away. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I think, for the church, you didn't. And, you know, foot to the groin aside, I think it's remarkable that today St. Stephen's does still exist, although it still has the, 
I guess, fragility or potential for closure that existed back then. Is that correct? Well, it's still you know, on a month-to-month -month basis. At this point, from what I understand, they have, they have survived, so to speak. But I kind of regret the fact that I helped them survive. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, it's interesting in this film that you, as the filmmaker, go through a type of religious journey where you're questioning your own heritage and questioning your own religion. Where do you stand now? What sort of what has been the outcome for you personally of this whole process? Well, I guess, I, as I said, I was Anglican light, and I wanted the adventure to sort of concretize what in me was religious. Mm -hmm. And it became very strong. It was very powerful. But at the end of the day, um, my, you know, what happened was I was running the homeless breakfast there, and I raised enough money so that that homeless breakfast has, is now paid for another year. And what did they do? They moved us out of there for a real estate rental. And I was so upset about that, I thought, that's it. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of, 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 of religion, it was such a depressing revelation to me about how thin institutionalized religion is. And I've decided that I'm a Tutu Anglican, as in Desmond Tutu in South Africa. And I, I don't think it's, it's what he does is uh, religious above all else, but it's a physical um, Act, activism, I guess. It's mm -hmm. doing things that need to be done for people who need it. It's also, there's something in us in moments of great extremism, and I felt this as uh, when I was a teenager, sort of imprisoned for the apartheid thing, that you do not have any friends, and you need to speak to somebody. There is a force there. There is a force there for good. And the whole experience has left me believing that, that those people in the community have a better idea of what is to the good. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that what, you know, what's happened in Iraq, uh, what, what's happened with Christianity in, in the States, has, has led me to believe that for the rest of my life, I'm much more interested in atheism, that in people who do not lean on God, there is as great goodness as people who give it up, give it all up to, to God. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been, a, I guess, in a way, a completely unexpected transformation in myself. Because what, I'm, what you're worried about if you eschew God is, um, I guess, you, you know, you're, you're more likely to become evil, or you're more likely to become lazy, or you're more likely to do bad things. And in actual fact, Religion has done so many bad things and has caused such violence and has caused this terrible, terrible war in Iraq. And the religious guys on the other side, God help us, are no better. Mm -hmm. And an another sort of revelation I had was I interviewed this colonel uh, in the road between Baghdad and Basra, C Lieutenant Colonel J.J. Pomfret. He was the head of the Marines in a place called Diawania. And he felt seized by the Lord when he drove his tanks up from you know, the, where Job and Abraham, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the obscenity that's been visited on the people of Iraq by people who believe it's their biblical mission. Well, it's it, like it almost is like a new version of the Crusades. And, and unfortunately, we have run out of time, but it has seen from this story that the community response in saving a space in the community is, is really the moral rather than perhaps any of the religious or other organizational aspects. Yeah, and a spirituality mm -hmm. that is in community, and mm -hmm. a spirituality that's in Canada, uh, not these tribes not an that, that have embedded in their religious DNA and in their texts, texts. I mean, look at the Bible. Pop mm -hmm. into an African church any Sunday. Hatred and warfare. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for coming in, Robin. Certainly, this has been a very interesting discussion, and certainly our audience can find out more about this film from your website. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot. That was filmmaker Robin Benger. Next up on 3D Dialogue, how prayer and exercise can go hand in hand. We'll tell you more right after the break. Please stay tuned. <laughs>